Olá, boa tarde. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tatiana Telefona. I work at the State Health Secretariat. It's a, st a strange name. Uh, with, it's, it's strange that I'm, that I'm here because it's, this event is uh, for cities. But I would like to thank uh, the, you for the invitation. And so what's the goal of this conversation? We want to talk about Rio de Janeiro municipal actions on health healthy, safe, and sustainable foods. In addition to working at the, at the state health secretariat, I'm also a councilwoman at the, the Sustainable Food and Nutrition, and I'm also part of the Intersecretary of Food Security, Food Security and Nutrition in the city of Rio. We're going to bring together a group of strategies, a governmental strategies, and of course, the Brazilian government with its different institutions, if it includes social participation and also uh, these government instruments, that's why the state is part of this panel. And I would like to invite the speakers, all of them, to, uh, to come up the stage so that we can start our panel discussion. So I'm going to start here. Our first speaker is Monica Armada. A segunda palestra. Our second speaker is Giselle de Salvignon. Our third speaker is Marluce Fortunato. Our fourth speaker is Aline Borges. E a quinta palestrante. And our fifth speaker is Vitória Veloso. Antes de passar para. Before I give Monica the floor, I would also say in the introduction that health, education, and food are part of our federal constitution. Food, so education and health since the 80s, and food came after a long dispute, and then it was included in 2010. So we understand that the scope of the things that will be discussed here are part of the scope of policies that promote food security together with other areas like in the previous discussions that we have like agriculture local development among others so i'll give the floor to monica and i'll also give her the presentation monica Ahmad is a nutritionist she is a resident in maternal and child nutrition and specialist in clinical nutrition she is the coordinator of the Herculano Pinheiro Hospital, and she will talk about her experience in the Human Milk Bank. Good afternoon. Can anyone hear, everyone hear me? Good afternoon. I want to congratulate the organization of this event and also thank my dear nutritionist colleagues, Andrea Ricardo, Alini, for allowing this invitation. So I work in a maternity, a public maternity maternity hospital. 
I am very proud a public servant and this unit is in the north zone of Rio and it's an area it's a very poor area a very needy area it's a very big area so um, Rio is divided in areas strategic areas and our area is a very big area of a very needy population and we have our human milk bank our hospital is what we call a maternity hospital and this hospital is a friend of the child is a child friendly hospital and we have many of those in around the city and in our health secretary we have 16 six human milk banks and they all work with the same routine because we have the Fernandes Figueira Institute that is our global reference for human milk so we export our technology so we're very proud of all the work that's developed by human milk banks also from the municipal secretary of health in Rio and the human milk banks from our secretary they are coordinated by nutritionists and these human milk banks are connected to UNATI so it's an honor for us to participate in this coordination we have different approaches and levels of donation so we have mothers that donate to their own children and sometimes this milk donation is in regard not just of the care it's also the food Hum uh, human milk is the first functional food that we have the first food and the first functional food that we receive so we are leaving aside when we talk about eating real food we have human milk that is the beginning of it all so these mothers sometimes of premature children they cannot yet feed themselves or even get food but they can receive the breast milk by immunotherapy with colostrum therapy so we have babies in a zero diet they're already receiving colostrum through an oral way so then they start with this milk as their first food so we're showing a mother who is donating blood to her own children she can also collect from the bank but we also have this protocol that a mother can collect and donate to their own children we have protocols for that and as you can see the second picture she is doing the donation and we are using materials that can be reused glasses with plastic um, taps then we can sterilize and clean so we can always reuse this glass and also the cups sometimes babies cannot breastfeed so they will drink the milk from this little cup that is clean sterilized and so we are already doing sustainable um, ways of using this milk and so you can see the approach and the flow chart a lot of healthy women they can donate human milk we talk about uh, milk and wet nurses and we when we talk about sexual transmitted disease or transmitted diseases 
So we have now the human milk banks to process the milk that comes through healthy women so they can donate blo uh, milk. And we do all the processing and analyzing of this milk so we can deliver to this baby is in who is in the first care unit this milk already present in the case that their own mother cannot donate their own mother uh, own milk or doesn't have enough milk and then we have these healthy donators who are maybe not any they are not in the maternity leave anymore so they are in their own rooms so they will be uh, connected by our basic health units so we integrate with the basic health units so they can do this connection with the mothers and the donators with the milk for the banks so that's the flow chart that we are showing and we capacitate the workers from the basic health units because everything needs to be done in a safe way because we have this baby who will receive the milk so in the top picture we show Zilda and we have a very uh, a lot of professions involved we have doctors nurses technicians so different levels involved even people who are working with the s security of the building they are all working because we're not just distributors of human milk because all the workers they support the breastfeeding S because if a mother n can donate they need to be able to breastfeed so that surplus goes to another baby so we also work with capacitating all of the workers and in the second picture we show us collecting the milk and receiving donations we have this route for receiving milk each bank with their own routine but we all try to integrate with the different units so that we can receive milk because there are women who are throwing milk out and there are so many children who need this surplus milk and in the third picture we have a small baby who might maybe receive a surplus he breastfeeds with their, his mother's milk and also a surplus or maybe that's its own quantity and now he's receiving that milk the pasteurized milk so we have many events because we want to educate the community and the population so we have the month of breastfeeding that we celebrate on the 19th of May and we also have breastfeeding celebration in the second semester so we call it the golden August and next month we'll celebrate premature babies so let's work all we year because babies are being born and more and more they are being born premature so we need to care for these little Brazilians so we need have the events from the basic units the basic health units so we go and we participate together with the community and together with health professionals and also this year we had the event Amamenta Rio which was in Madureira Park in the north zone we had the first meeting of milk banks in the Getulio Vargas Memorial. It was a very important occasion for us. So we had the presence of all of our six banks. We also had 
a celebration in the min uh, city hall in Rio. We were celebrated there. And I couldn't not show representing all of our donors, all these women, let's see, in the sixth picture, let me count here, yes, picture number six, they are what we call our donors, and we call them our workers, and they are our professionals, they help us, and they are on the front lines, we train them, and, but we also need to supervise and do all the other activities. So these are the women in the front lines. They are pasteurizing the milk. They are distributing milk. So our, we celebrate these workers. And some of them are with me for over 20 years. So it's an honor to have them in our unit. So I'm already done, I'm almost done. So I just wanna show you a few of the data from the Human Milk Bank. So this was just last year. So this is Rio de Janeiro. See how many people we have already reached. We have more than 7,000 liters of milk that was processed and we also attended more s over 6,000 babies. So imagine if we can achieve this to, to for the whole nation. So this will be so important for us. And our challenge is, is that all units, all basic health units may become a center for collection of human milk so that no baby may be hungry again. Thank you so much. Obrigada, Monica. Thank you, Monica. I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, Gisele de Sauvignon. She is an, uh, a dietitian at the Anadias Nutrition Unit. She's one of the uh, people in charge of the Pinai in the, in the city of Rio. I would just like to ask you to change places with me because I'm so tall that I can't. But I can't. I can't see the, the slides. You you were saying something and, and it re reminded me of my baby when he was uh, when he, he was small. I remember that I remember about the milk and we called the fire department and they collected the milk and they took to your uh, uh, the, to the bank. I think it was at Fernandes Figueira Institute. So they took the milk and they they processed the milk. So it just what you, what you your speech reminded me of a very uh, dear time in my life. Okay, so the National School Feeding Program in the city of Rio de Janeiro. It is one of the largest programs of school feeding in the world. It started in the 1950s, and it serves uh, basic education children in the um, public municipal schools. In the 1950s, there was hunger in Brazil, so the program started as uh, as an addition to the nutrition that children received at home to food that they received at home. As time went by, this this uh, vision of, of the program changed. So in 2006, with Lausanne, we include healthy nutrition as a human right, because food has always been a human right. But adequate food brought a different meaning to what is done in schools nowadays. So this law 11947 of 2009 is very important because it brings this issue of healthy food as a human right. It also 
and it also included nutrition into the political and pedagogical program of schools. So we started including food and nutrition in the classroom. So when children sit down to eat, they already know why they're eating what they're eating. There was also more support of popular participation and uh, encouraging the exercise of social control. Uh, through CAI and CONSEA, which are the councils, the different councils, and also this new view of nutrition. What happens is that PINAI, this program, is now a food and nutrition security program that is very important for uh, our children in, in Rio de Janeiro. And it's a huge program, and we're going to see the numbers in Rio de Janeiro. And it brings this idea of universality and equity. It's for everybody, and it's what one child eats at a given school. It's the same that they'll eat in the northern, uh, in, a, in a school in the northern region or the southern region of Brazil. It's the same for everybody. So how does this happen in Brazil, in Rio? Uh, there is a administrative and um, budgetary part, and this is run by the Municipal Secretary of Education. And in Rio, there is a difference uh, because here, we this NSD and Nutrition Institute belongs to the Health Secretariat because the client is the same. Children who are at school are the same children who are in basic education. So this allows us to identify some situations at school and uh, allows us to to direct these children to the uh, basic care healthcare unit, to a Prodia program for our persistent diarrhea. So the this child is seen by different eyes. So we we have our collaborators who provide technical support. We have the municipal controllership, we have ePLAN, which is the municipal IT services. And all the planning that we do uh, goes into this system, this ePLAN system. The macro and micro, m macro and micronutrients are calculated. And so we have um, a number of children by age group. So this system, this ePLAN, generates the amount of food that needs to be bought, that needs to be purchased. Pinai doesn't happen on its own. We have a whole network. So we have the Health Secretariat, Education Secretariat, the PSC, the councils. We have Rio Urbe, the companies that hire the, uh, the workers. We, we have all the family control uh, as well. And Pinay in Rio is a great challenge because our numbers are very, very large. Everything in Rio is big. So now in Rio, we have 1,544 schools in operation. We have very many different types of schools. We have vocational schools, we have, and for each type of school, there is a type of nutrition planning uh, for, for each type of school, as I said. So the number of students that we have is around 634,000 students. So it's a huge number of students, a huge number of people eating at school. And of this total, two thirds, about two thirds are uh, half time, either in the morning or in the afternoon, and one third, which are the kindergarten schools or the daycare schools, they are full time school. So how are this, these units distributed in the municipality? There are three uh, regional geographic distribution of the coordinations. There are 11, actually, where you see number four. There, was, uh, there are two numbers in the blue area. Actually, there would be the 11th coordination. The National uh, Fund, FNDE, uh, National Education Fund, that gives us the guidelines that will guide the, the all, all nutrition, all the, the procurement as well. The last resolution 
which is the one we base our work on, is Resolution 6 of 2020. But we don't use only this resolution as the foundation to uh, for our planning. We use other guidelines, other nutritional and health guidelines, such as the nutrition gu guide it was published in 2014 and was reviewed in 2016 and it got international awards yes. and this guide focuses on the issues of the brazilian population and the orange one is also a version of the guide for children under two years old brazilian children so we have other references as well but the main reference is the fnde reference which is ref the resolution number six and in this resolution, this resolution states that this planning is the, doing this is the job of the nutrition, it's actually a dietitian, and the school meal menus should be prepared by the nutritionist of the PNI based on the use of fresh or minimally processed foods in order to respect nutritional needs, eating habits, the food culture uh, of the, the region, and be guided by the sustainability, season, seasonability, and agricultural diversification of the region and promotion of adequate and healthy food. So what started in the 1950s just as a complement, uh, just to add to the food that children got at home, now it's completely different. It thinks uh, it considers the habits, sustainabilities, eating habits, sustainabilities. There, there are different nuances to what the program offers. In the resolution is also included that the fact that menus should be adapted to meet students diagnosed with special dietary needs such as celiac disease, diabetes, hypertension, iron deficiency, allergies and food intolerance, among others. So based on all the guidelines, we put together a, a, a nutrition guide that will guide schools in executing PNAI. So how they should in practice the PNI in the school unit. And then the same material, there are the technical f uh, charts for uh, or tables for you to, to, to calculate the quantities that are offered, the, the amount of sugar, salt, fat, and, and rice, and beans. All the, the foods are, 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 are calculated according to the age group. And the, these numbers go, are, are input into are put into a system and they generate the the calculation of the number of foods that they need to, that children need to receive in a given at any given week so you have the menus and the amounts of food so we can um, prevent waste food waste and if there is a situation in which students couldn't come for a, for a reason, there was uh, too much rain or something like that, you can decrease in the next uh, purchase, in the next, uh, uh, you can, you can re decrease the amount of food that is received by the school because we get food every week. So you have fresh foods weekly in the unit. So these are pictures that we take during the technical visits these are the professionals who work for us. We also have this law, 12982 of 2014, and, it's, uh, and it works in addition to the re resolution number si six of uh, FNDE. And uh, Anis Diaz, since we are always in the forefront, we already meet the needs we have done this for a long time. We, we have met the needs of these uh, children for a long time, the special needs. I can't, I can't tell you how long I've been doing this because I would tell you how old I am. But uh, the thing is we already meet the needs of, uh, the special needs of children. So we added that, we, we, we say that we adding up, we had 1,200 actions of individualized care to children with specific nutritional needs. We also meet uh, religious or vegetarian needs. And this is something that we also do, we pay attention to. We also um, welcome these children. But the thing is, we end up having to buy specific products to meet the needs of these children. 
So we need to have lactose-free program uh, products or uh, textured soy protein, rice mass. In addition to the foods that already are in the in the, the peanut plan, we we have another portfolio of products for the, these special situations. What we see the most: uh, lactose intolerance, uh, allergy to milk protein. Children are not allergic to one thing only; they uh, they are allergic to many things at the same time. And we've seen also uh, an increase in the in autism. We've, we've received many children with uh, food selectiveness due to autism. Pinay says that we need to use at, at least 75% of resources, resources to buy fresh or minimally processed foods, but we use much more than that in our planning. And just for you to have an idea of the amounts, it's not it's not, uh, it's, we work with tons, you know, just for you to understand. When we do our, we do plenty of this magnitude, we need to pay a lot of attention. We did to do this in advance because we, otherwise we can cause a uh, lack of provision in the city. So this is other thing that the resolution says is that we need to use at least 30% of our resources to buy, uh, foods from family agriculture. But Rio now was able to reach 40% of goods from family agriculture. And we have uh, examples of uh, products that are purchased with these resources. The resolution also prohibits ultra processed foods and beverages. We don't use uh, monosodium, monosodium glutamate or sodium salts. But as Rio is always in the, in the forefront, we haven't, uh, we, for, for 20 years, we haven't, we haven't uh, included these things. Uh, we had a municipal a city decree that was so restricted that it ended school, uh, luncheons, uh, school, fast food because uh, f schools at, at uh, foods that food at school cannot be ultra processed or anything that like that and it also uh, prohibits advertising of foods in the school environment so this also protects children from exposure to advertising to this media uh, this media that invades uh, our uh, that is everywhere. So we protect the school environment. So Pinay is not only about feeding, it's, it's more than that. There is a lot that is done to promote health, to, to, to foster good eating habits. So this is part of the educational program. At school, children are protected from uh, unhealthy foods. And everything that they learn at school is shown or can be seen in their in the food that they receive at school. So it's very beautiful. Uh, it's very beautiful to see all that. These are pictures, myself and Renata. We are doing nutritional education activities with uh, students' parents with children in the, 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 the picture in the middle and with the um, people who prepare the foods. The resolution also states that uh, ed nutritional education needs to be permanent, transdisciplinary, intersectoral, and multiprofessional. We have done this for a long, long time, not only since 2020. And with that, with this complexity, I'm almost done. I just need two more slides, but I'm seeing people agreeing. So I pe think people are liking my presentation. I'm sorry, my friends. <laughs> okay, but how do we do things? We have menus for summer and winter because we respect seasons. 
the agriculture seasons in our city. So we plan four weeks of menus and they happen simultaneously in these 11 areas that I've shown before, because if everyone starts in week A and everyone uses, let's say, pumpkin, then our supermarkets won't have pumpkin. So we do these weeks in an alternate way, way in all the 11 zones. And menus have breakfast, a milky meal, lunch. So we have many different levels. So we have also snacks, one, two, three different levels. So we have dinner when children are on an all day school according to the profile of the school. So the preparation of these menus, they are basically composed of vegetable, orange, fresh and minimally processed. We offer fruits daily. We don't offer sweets for children lower than three years old. Even though the guide for Brazilian children lower than two years and FND says three, we go beyond that. We don't give sugar or ultra processed or honey foods for children under three years and 11 months. We also control fat, proteins and other elements through our charts, but also we have today 32 types of vegetables, 16 types of fruits and four types of beans and lentils. In our composition of meals, we have lunch and dinner, breakfast and snacks. We don't use processed meat. And one presentation uh, said that uh, they use processed food, but we don't. And we only have, uh, we have provided just 162 million over 162 million foods. So thank you so much. I, I know I talk too much. Thank you so much, Giselle. I'm here with a very bad uh, role that I'm controlling time. I was a student in the municipal network of schools and I'm happy to testify that this has been done for a long time. And I'm now gonna give the floor to the next speaker who will be done by Marluce Fornato. She's a nutritionist and also a lawyer. She's also a counselor in the regional city hall for the she's also the manager of the nutrition unit on ideas and the head of the nutrition services in Rio okay everyone I want to thank the presence of you all in this time frame to hear from us with our presentation, with our table, and mainly just talking about public purchases. UNADI, our NDS nutrition unit, our nutri we are in the South Zone, and today this is how it look like. This is a sector that is responsible for the technical coordination of food and nutrition in the city of Rio. So we are particular in this way. We work with all of the city's hall secretaries. We have reference terms written from the mayor's cabinets to public uh, businesses. So we are mainly composed by nutritionists and professors, and we are inside of the organization of Invisa Rio, the Municipal Institute of Sanitary Surveillance. Before going into the topic, I want to say that I am a manager of the Andes Institute since last June. And this table right here is making me so proud as a manager because it personifies all the work that we've been doing in this last year. It personifies the welcoming of this team inside Evisa and it also personifies 
the effort of all of us as professionals. This is a daily work is a very hard work, it consumes us. Our work doesn't end in the moment that we leave our work. It remains because those who eat, they hurry because there is no right day or time to eat. So our job is involved in maintaining and promoting food security of all people who are inside one of the units in our city hall. So I want to begin talking about public purchases. So talking about the world pacts and local pacts, public sustainable public purchases is one of the goals of the 2030 agenda. And inside the SDG 12, it says that is a promotion of sustainable production and sustainable consumption. And that means that we need to ha resignify this production, this food production. So we need to resignify not only resignify, we need to promote this sustainable purchase. We need to modify how this will be done inside society. Because sustainable purchases and sustainability, it doesn't just stays in one place. It goes throughout the food cycle from production to the waste. So when until the food becomes waste, so sustainable purchase needs to take this into account through this goal. And also when we talk about the local pact in the sustainable development plans. So sustainable public purchase is one of our strategies inside governance. And being one strategy inside governance until 2030. So please, can you? So it needs to guarantee that 30% of food that is purchased by the city of Rio for food programs in the administration needs to come from family agriculture. So that means any purchase of food products until 2030 by the city hall of Rio de Janeiro needs to come through the sustainable feeding program, guaranteeing that 30% of these produce and the permanent contracts, they come follow criteria of sustainability. So like what we said, since 2030, there is already a green catalog. And this has been done by the Municipal Environment Secretary and also the Management Secretary. So the City of Rio already has a catalog of green materials and also to ensure that 30% of the procedures of for contracting services by the City Hall follow sustainability criteria. And we already followed this and I'm going to show you. Okay, very well. Why implement public purchases? In terms of public purchases, there is a huge volume of budget that goes towards public purchases, both in a federal, state, and municipal levels. So that goes around 20%, this margin of this budget. And this budget needs to be used to promote public purchases that are done in a sustainable way. 
And what are the benefits of sustainable public purchases? Through this, governments can lead by example and achieve key policy goals that are fundamental. And sustainable procurement allows the government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve resource efficiency, and encourage recycling. So it brings positive social outcomes, such as reducing poverty, increasing equity, and meeting core labor standards. And the positive economic results, because they do generate income, reduce costs, and support the transfer of skills and technologies. So when we, when we talk about our legal area, and we have a law, the 8666-1993 and the 12349 from 2010. These are two laws that talk about public purchases. The 8666 already had in it, when it talked about public purchases, that it would be necessary to foster sustainable purchases. And the law 12349 says that we need to foster sustainable public purchases and the, the, respons the organ responsible for the executive would be made responsible if the law wasn't followed in this public purchase agreement. So let's talk about a step-by-step -step for sustainable public purchases. So the first step in these procedures would be the necessity for contracting and all the processes for public purchases can only occur if there is the necessity for it. Every time that a public organ sends a, so a, need, an, a need for a public purchase, the first thing that is asked is the necessity for this purchase process. Then we have the planning of the contract with sustainability parameters. And we need to talk about the terms of reference, what will guide, and what will be the parameters and the execution of this purchase. And also in the third step, we need to have the analysis of the balance between the binding principles of equality advantages and sustainability. So not everything that's cheaper is better inside a public purchase. If it's not sustainable, then this won't bring quality for everything that's being purchased by the government agency. If it's not durable, if it's not sustainable, it's not a quality purchase. So the economic value is also holistic. So talking about, about our reference terms, which is what we work on inside the Rio de Janeiro City Hall, we try to do this in a way that guarantees some sort of food security. So bringing more food security f to our customers, so to say, and a more sustainable public purchase. So we think about uh, a lack of waste and we try to not use ultra processed foods. We think about uh, waste collection. We think about the issue of waste. We think about the issue of fat and how we discard fat and the use of 
things that can be thrown out and not reused. And I also want to present some strategies for more efficiency in a public purchase in a sustainable way. One of our strategies that we use is let me is a shared purchase. So there are two ways instead inside of a sustainable governance to guarantee a shared purchase. One way is to have measures that are centralized. One way is shared purchase, and another way is the centralized purchase. So a shared pur purchase is something that is optional. And this is used by the federal government. So we have one agency that is specialized in this sort of purchase, and they do this, and then they share this purchase with the other levels. And our in a, the city hall, we do the centralized purchase. And then this way, we have efficiency in a sustainable per public purchase. So in the reference term, it needs to guide itself through sustainability, both in the legal term, because it guarantees efficiency in what will be executed, and also a purchase that is shared or centralized. It allows for big quantities to be purchased. So we can qualify that food produce, that food service in a sustainable way, making that, that service and that food produce have a lower economic value because of the quantity that we will purchase. It also allows for a pattern and also to have a better use of the money. And we can also have more efficiency in sustainable governance. And also, OK, let's go back to the other slide. When we talk about Rio de Janeiro City Hall, our last bidding process for food was made in a centralized way. That's one of the strategies of sustainability governance. That, that bidding process was done for 40 areas. And also, comparing this process and the value of was in the bidding process and what was already being spent, this budget was smaller. And for the period of 24 months, that's how much the bidding process lasts for, it will be lower than what was previously spent. So we have efficiency. And the efficiency that's expected inside a governance that's being managed. So that we have efficiency and sustainability inside the governance. And we need to have a healthy relationship between governance and management. We need to have governance to show strategies for management, and management needs to plan, execute, and control, and later on give back to governance also uh, some sort of accountability. And they seek a fair price, some economy in the management processes. And I just wanted to show some pictures of this is the meals that we serve inside our health units. And more precisely in the Miguel Couto Hospital, I asked my colleague to send me 
these pictures because these meals are done with a lot of care and education. They are made with a lot of commitment by the professionals who are inside our city hall because it's us, the nutritionists, who are part of this whole management network. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marluci, for uh, sharing your experience. Yet another experience with, uh, with of the city of Rio. We were talking about it, this uh, theme in other panels. So I'd like to give the floor to Aline Borges. It's the second. Sp it's uh, this Aline is the president of S E Visa Rio. And would you like me to to pass the slides, or uh, do you want to do it yourself? Good afternoon. I'm going to to tell you about uh, our experience when it comes to the implementation of the special municipal service. Why are we talking about municipal inspection service? We use it as a tool to include small rural producers. I've worked in the municipal surveillance um, for uh, many years, and I, for a long time I was a specter, and I inspected, and I found many problems when it came to uh, animal products that circulate in the city of Rio. And we, and many of these products were produced in the city of Rio and they were they could not be commercialized and uh, that um, that made me want to look for this implementation of this system and how could we do that in 2017 we started to write the new sanitary municipal sanitary code and in this code we included the we had this sanitary surveillance agricultural inspection so within the municipal health secretariat and thinking about what the single uh, health we took all of the productive chain from productive to uh, retail and this allowed us to implement the farming inspection center so of course we started to regulate this and we created the institute of uh, sanitary surveillance zoonosis surveillance and in this institute we now have the coordination of this institute and in the future we'll be able to request this equivalent with the Ministry of Agriculture. And what does this mean to the municipality? If everything is equivalent, products that are registered in the municipality can be sold all over the country. So what is this municipal inspection service? It is a breakthrough program which enables more throughout thorough control and inspection of products of animal origin. It was launched in August 2019 to benefit local and family agriculture, especially uh, family agriculture, through simplified regularization of small businesses. This service enables the, com the, enable the selling locally produced goods in a controlled environment following sanitary norms. And who uses this? Who can benefit from this? Every business, all producers, all businesses that get, produce, modify, package, or stock products or subproducts of animal origin. How was the implementation done? There was the supplementary law, as was mentioned before, and 
what we started to see that we needed was we started to go after these small farmers or small producers because we needed to find where they were. There is no registry. There is no rural registry. We don't have this at the city government. We don't have all the the them all of them registered. And this um, master plan, the Rio Municipal Master Plan, does not recognize rural areas. Therefore, small farmers or small producers cannot register. They cannot register to be part of public purchases. They cannot enroll in uh, PINAI, PINAI, PAA programs. So we really need to review this master plan so that we can implement and allow small entrepreneurs to be part of public purchases. So implementation of this inspection aimed at maximizing small distribu small entrepreneurs' distribution because if products are formalized, they, of course, can be sold in a, uh, in a larger scale, and this will allow for growth. We also would add value to to local farmers and will allow them to be part of public purchases. These are some examples of our active search. For us to implement this, we needed where to know where to find them. As I said, we don't have a registry of these rural uh, properties. So we have to look in uh, social networks, social media, and we found some small producers. For example, this Laticinio Don Fernão produces, uh, actually treats 2,100 liters of milk per week. And it, it's a dairy farm, and it produces 800 liters of yogurt and 200 kilograms of white cheese. It's called Minas Frescal, the name of the cheese. And it's and it, it is not legalized. It's not. Uh, you don't know where this milk came from. You don't know wh if the milk has been properly pasteurized. So it's a risk uh, to uh, to, uh, to to consume these products. So the goal of this project is to formalize the small producer and allow them to distribute, to sell their products locally and regionally um, in, a, in a legal way. We also found the Rio da Prata bee farm or apiary. It produces three tons of honey per year and it's, also, it's, and it's not registered either. So we are working with them to change their structure, improve their flow and uh, formalize this apiary apiary so that they can be part of public purchases. Another example is this Santa Cândida farm. People say that the municipality of Rio is an urban municipality, but we still have a lot of uh, rural production. This is the Santa Cândida farm. It produces 90 dozens of eggs per day and it cannot distribute the eggs. That's why we find in the municipality many, many cars that sell eggs. And that was a cooperative reached, uh, reached me and uh, they told me that they wanted to, to organize a cooperative so that they can be formalized. And uh, we are doing this. We are working with uh, the Santa Cândida Farm, along with Embrapa, in this project called called Ovo Limpo, Clean Egg. And once they are they are legalized, all 
all their eggs are going to be purchased by Zona Sul supermarket because they are organic producers and uh, th this is what the Zona Sul supermarket wants. And there is another formal agro-industry that was registered in the municipality of Rio called Zuka and they are, they are meat produ uh, producers and it's been registered in June and immediately after they uh, were part of the Rio Gastronomia event, a gastronomy event, and all of the produce, the pro their production is already sold. They are distributing th uh, their production very fast and broadly. They have expanded their their reach. And what Zuka told us is that they now need to expand their infrastructure because they cannot handle the uh, all the the demand so this is a project that will be uh, through which we'll be able to foster local economy and include the small producers and promote equality sustainability to all that's why what i wanted to tell you thank you very much thank you alini for uh sharing your experience uh, with us. Now I would like to give the floor to, the, to our last speaker. I don't know uh, how it, we are uh, concerning time, but uh, I think that we should have a Q&A session as well. Now I would like to, to give the floor to Victoria Veloso. She is, uh, she is the coordinator of innovation projects in, of Ivisa Rio. Good afternoon. Thank you for your persistence. I'll be very brief. What is our agenda? Our agenda is a capacity building agenda. How can we promote within the set of challenges imposed by these developments an agenda of capacity building in health surveillance that would promote healthy, safe, and sustainable food. So we want health education, safe food, and protection of citizens' health. So our agenda at Evisa is guided towards a strategic view that health surveillance as one of the four components of health surveillance is a part of SUS. And therefore, we need to advance not only the, in the construction of this narrative, but also so that this narrative is built on the offer of capacity building structured for the different segments involved in the production chain. So the first step for this agenda that is not taken by us. It started in 1991. In 1991, in the, uh, uh, an initiative by Wilson Leite, representative uh, at the, the municipal chamber, uh, this law is approved, the law number is 1662. It establishes that all employees uh, and owners of restaurants, cafeterias, hotels, bars, supermarkets, butchers, meat houses, etc., will have to attend a course on notions of hygiene to be administered by the municipal health development. So this is a law that has a great potential to protect the health of citizens. So why is this law so important? First the fact that it is that it obligates that 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 it includes the mandatory capacity building uh, process so it's a law that states that it is the responsibility of the health secretariat to build capacity with all the workers that manipulate food including transportation of food one uh, important element is that these courses have to be free and all interested have to be able to attend. Another important aspect is that the law 
states the following. The absence of the proper uh, capacity building in these um, workers can be uh, can be fined by the health secretariat. And last, an another very important element is the time that it takes to adapt. At that point in time, in 1991, there was a period of time that was granted for us to restructure it because at that time, SUS was still um, in, this, in the process of inception. And uh, from 1992, the development was faster. So a time was given to us for us to adapt to this new agenda. And since then, what we see is a great effort by the Municipal Health Secretariat to improve or to expand capacity building in this area. There included the formalization of some partnerships with the Union of Restaurants, the Association of Supermarkets, so that we could expand and provide this free capacity building that is so necessary in, in managing sanitary risk. So what do we have today? Today we have within this scenario that starts in 1991, what we have now after 20 years of this, the, of this law, we have this capacity building as part of this strategic agenda that strengthens health surveillable as an inseparable component of the SUS. We also have an action plan that is aimed at making the Institute a reference in the production and dissemination of knowledge in the field of sanitary surveillance, zoonosis control, and also agricultural inspection. And uh, we also have as the goal of our work within EVISA, within the general coordination of innovation projects and uh, sanitary education, the fact that we want the Institute to be a reference in the production and dissemination of knowledge in these large feuds, fields that the Institute acts. Therefore, the Institute fulfills its mission of identifying, mitigating, managing, and, mitig and, and, and managing sanitary risk and protecting the health of citizens. So what did we do? We promoted a huge restructuring effort. So what did we do then? We standardized training plans, capacity building plans. Then we introduced a set of interactive tools which included institutional video production, which in introduces our training courses, and it, and it uh, shows how complex the situation is. We also created an, a structure that is able to deal not only with technical support, but also logistical support to training facilitators. And we also reviewed content. We improved our m uh, methodological tools. And we tested some e-learning courses. We did not have the response that we expected or the results that we expected. But we have three pillars in the, works that, the work that we developed. The pillars are integration, empathy, and prototyping. So all this agenda of restructuring training was conducted aiming at integrating the institute, expanding this capacity building capacity uh, with other sectors of the, the city government itself. We have the visa collaborate, collaborative agenda that allows us to work along with the João Goulart Foundation, the Getúlio Vargas Foundation, the uh, UPP, and other partners in this process. 
another important agenda, another important pillar is empathy. We, all of this was done through active listening with this internal groups, the, the internal coordinations of the Institute and other sectors of the, secret, uh, the municipal health secretariat and the government. So we understood that we needed to train, to test some initiatives. And even if results were not exactly what we would wish for, we learned with, from the tests. And I don't know if our video will play, but how can we put this into practice, this whole agenda? Integration, empathy, prototyping, these are maybe abstract themes sometimes, but how can we put all of this into practice to work outside of the box? So in terms of capacity building, we created a innovation challenge. So uh, we're not going to show the video, but I just wanted to show you what did we had in this video. This video was a strategy of putting our facilitators in the place of our students. And they were invited to cook their own recipe. So this is a video of people who are taking the course of food manipulation, cooking a meal. And they are now knowing how challenging it is and how much it needs innovation. So empathy is not just abstract, it's an exercise of listening to others, to putting yourself on someone else's shoes, and it needs to exist. So this video, I wish you could see it, it only the three minute long, is so you could see our facilitators s living the experience of having to wash their hands correctly and having to clean a produce correctly. So inside this, um, environment, we were able to amplify the offer for capacity building. So we were able already last year to 2021 and on 2022, we were able to offer a training, a specific training. And we also have 144 different classes. And we also had more than 11,000 people who were trained in the capacity building. And we also had 57 different types. And this year, I think we will even have the goal of uh, reaching 95 different training types until the end of the year. So next slide, please. And I'm now here highlighting to what in our capacity building trainings goes for towards food handling. So in 2021, this reached over 60% of our number of classes. And this year is already on 66% of number of classes. And this is due to an effort of reaching every worker in the field of food handling for the Rock in Rio Festival. R the Rock in Rio Music Festival is so important for the city, but also brings this necessity of mass training for those who work in the festival. And this also reflects in our numbers because the number of certificates that we have issued uh, and to almost this month is until the end of this month, we already certificated more than 9,000 people. And the last thing I wanted to show you is side by side with this effort of capacity building, we also have opened a new uh, research line. And this is important because in the picture of having this institute as a reference in the sharing of knowledge, we need to retrofit this knowledge. We need to make this knowledge visible to the technical 
abilities that exist inside our institute and direct these abilities for the training in the capacity building processes. So we've opened four major research lines, epidemiology and one health, safe food and healthy eating, which is our theme here, education, communication and management in health surveillance and health technologies risk management and patient safety culture implementation. And when we talk about the offer of the research, these are the numbers around our research lines that were launched on September 30th. And in this effort, we were able to put 33 research projects inside these lines and many 10 are institutional research projects combining uh, city hall secretaries and other participations like the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, State University of Rio de Janeiro and other organizations. We have 18 residency final papers and four master dissertations that came out of these lines of creating and facilitating knowledge pr production. And we also gathered 87 professionals and 62 of them are researchers. So you see this uh, cycle that continues around this idea that once you advance towards quality food, and adequate food and also the reduction of sanitary risks in our picture, our broader picture of the citizens' health. And inside these projects, most of them will end on 2023, but I can guarantee you that most of these projects will bring forth other fruits and they can also implicate for another research catalog that will be giving more attention for the population's dietary needs, both with the health sanitary agencies. And I also wanna tell you, Monica, something important, and I wanted you to consider in with a lot of care, the possibility that we could include in our catalog the training of the professionals who work in the milk banks. Because with your experience, we can bring and expand the access of training and capacity building for professionals who are interested in this area but don't have sometimes opportunity to go after this. And I want to tell you, Something very important about our trainings, our trainings, who are the people who go through our capacity building processes? The profile of the people who look for our trainings are the people who will not be able to access other trainings. So the public commitment of this agenda is great because the professional that has a high degree or a a higher degree, university degree, they have the budget to pay for a postgraduate program. And when we have a social media post, now we have around 8,000 views and this brought people from around our country to do these capacity building programs. So we are reaching an audience that if we hadn't opened this door, this audience wouldn't have the ability to gain these trainings. So public policy is also done through small gestures. So thank you so much. I want to thank all of the speakers, all the different experiences, great experience that were shared by the City Hall. Here I'm mostly a moderator because of our time. 
and also knowing the importance of best practices and experiences, management experiences in public policies they can bring out from the fostering of these initiatives and knowing that we're not alone. And we hope this will inspire other cities may be from the state of Rio because we have 92 cities in our state and even from other states and other countries because that's the goal of this forum. So I want to also give the opportunity for questions. If anyone wants to ask a question or bring a contribution. And I also want to give back the floor and, and I want you to talk about your social networks, maybe Evisa or uh, the other organizations. Does anyone have a question? Um, good evening. I don't ask. I don't speak Portuguese, but I will speak. I will speak in French or English, and I'll put the translation and I can then translate for my colleagues. I'm sorry. Merci. Donc je vais parler en français. Je sais pas s'il y a des interprètes. Voilà, merci. Je vous laisse savoir d'abord félicitations vraiment First of all, congratulations. I No. Ah, we're Portuguese. Okay. No, no, I will ask in French. Just French. Can you hear the translation? Okay, you can hear the translation. Okay, congratulations to all of you. First of all, you're all women, and that's amazing. And congratulations for everything that's been explained. I am responsible for these issues in Paris, and I was impressed to hear on the issues of sustainability and access to healthy food, durable food, sustainable food, and also talking about proximity. Were you able to measure your results? I could understand a bit. I was following what you were talking because I can understand a bit of Portuguese. But do you know in the schools if they are prepared inside the schools and if you have the results of this policy that is amazing? Uh, food is all, all the meals were produced in school. What results is specifically? What are the results that you want to know regarding how kids accept the food or how they deal with this? In relation to the program success, 90% of children participate in our program. And uh, in schools that have teenagers, sometimes they go out to date or have their meals at home. But through this technological system, we can monitor the adherence rate. And if the school ask or if we identify that in school we go and have educational programs inside the school 
with parents or with the students themselves to raise adherence. PNI asks that we have adherence of over 85%. I thank you. I sorry for the confusion and she congratulated the participation and she asked about the adherence of students with the food program and I'm so thankful for your participation from the C Paris City Hall. Anyone else has a question? Hi, my name is Jacqueline. I worked with Pinay in the city of Maricá, in the state of Rio. And I'm curious, I'm a nutritionist. Giselle, I would like to ask you, when the menu changes, what is the procedure you have the nutritionists that go and supervise in schools. When I was inside Pnai, I had a difficulty because I would supervise more than 10 schools. And for a reason, we would have to change menus and the logistics would get difficult to resolve. So I wanted to know how you work. It's hard in Rio to change the menu when it's necessary with a specific issue maybe uh, we have shortage of water in an unit or another we can maybe tell them to change the week menu so maybe something happened on Tuesday and they will change to the first day menu so that is very well articulated in schools then so there are no problems another question that I have so the ch child that wants to take food from their home, well, what we orient, what we say is that we don't support the child to bring food from home. And while we have the case of the autistic children, sometimes the mother is worried because that child has a lot of food needs. And we ask the mother to talk with the school staff and we also uh, support the mother to go and see their kid having their meals in school so they can see what is happening. And yes, in Marika, we also had uh, a lot of more autistic kids. Yes, it's a global issue. Yes, we have one more person here in the front. First of all, I want to thank all of you. I think it was a great conversation. Um, I saw this table with all women, and it's so important. Sometimes we go to other tabletops, and we don't see a lot of women, and even black women, in leadership roles. That's so important. And. I was so marveled by all the data and we want to talk with each of you. Uh, I've studied most of my life in the public system and it's so important when we talk about the fundamentals and we have the meals and see how much research goes into the menus when the kid goes and it's not just they go get the plate and then they go away but they have this whole education of how their meal was prepared what was researched because there is a team behind all of this and also inside the public education inside the favelas for example so maybe sometimes these kids, low-income kids, that will be their only meal. And we sometimes don't talk about this, but 
this sometimes is the only meals that the kid will have access to their whole day so it's important to have people like you that are thinking about this and putting it into practice and uh, so I wanted to congratulate you and say your work is magnificent I didn't know about your work and now I'm going to research more on this subject and if you want to learn more about our work you're uh, more than welcome to come to NSGS to our uh, center Yes, on Friday. Ah, oh, you're leaving on Friday? Oh, it's a pity. Pleasure to meet you. I'm going to give the floor to our, our other panelists, but we also uh, love the work of the City of Rio as the state network. As I mentioned before, there I, I have a sister who is a teacher at the the municipal school system. My mother was a, a school director, so I'm very inspired about this. And I wanted to to tell you that if you want to comment on food and nutritional security uh, concerning Pinai, and Monica also mentioned uh, about the Human Milk Bank, uh, you, if you want to talk more about this, it would be very interesting. <coughs> As I said before, concerning our work within UNAD, and because UNAD has this feature of working with the go city government, the, the originator city government, even though we are within the flowchart of the health, we work with all of the city government, uh, be it education, be it the cabinet of the mayor, the Conservation Secretariat, Pinai is the largest food security program, not only in Brazil, but in the world. So it guarantees the, the food, uh, the right to adequate food, and it guarantees food security of the population that needs it the most within the municipality of Rio de Janeiro. Not only the, in Rio, but in, in, in Brazil. And this guarantee of food security allows us within UNAD to have a very much qualified work. And I'll tell you why. Because we are assessed, we are evaluated, there is an inspection a very strong inspection by the public ministry and how when they look at all their pl uh, our planning on our menus they don't look only at the macronutrients they'd also look into the micronutrients so every now and then we have to 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 there is a process of accountability because we have 6,000 and I don't know how many, uh, 600,000 uh, children. And there is a group of uh, dietitians in the, the Ministry of Health, and they redo, they recalculate everything to see if we are actually delivering what we, we need to deliver. So there is also the, the, the CAI, which is the Food Nutrition Council, which is uh, the leader of this within the, the school units. And they talk to the CREA directors. They talk to the coordinators with the school principals. They ask questions about how the service is being provided, how this uh, food is being provided to schools. And nowadays, we can say that we guarantee food security of a large part of the population in the city of Rio de Janeiro because a child, once they are guaranteed their first food security at school, this generates savings at home because if they didn't have the food at school, 
they would that they, they they wouldn't have food at school so this guarantees savings in the family in families so this is a guarantee this guarantees that the family will be able to direct their income to uh, another need so nowadays just repeating again we guarantee the food security of a large part of the families in the city of Rio with Pinay. Mais alguma pergunta? Any other questions? Comments? So I'll do a final round with you so that you can comment on any other issues. If you want to give your institutional context, uh, social media, etc., please uh, feel free to do so. So I'm going to give the floor to Giselle. Uh, our email, it's pinai.unad at gmail.com. And you can talk directly to me or to Marlucy. Monica? concerning the network of human milk banks. You can access all the human milk banks and all the protocols and all the technical uh, notes. And all the maternity hospitals in Rio de Janeiro also have their Instagram accounts or profiles. So if you just add hospi maternity hospital, hospital maternidade, you can find all the hospitals. When it comes to Ercolano Pinheiro, uh, Maternity Hospital is at Ercolano Pinheiro. Thank you. I want to thank everyone to until this time so that we can have this conversation. And I also want to thank the organization of this forum. This debate, it was so great to have this conversation inside this important forum with Evisa, I believe, to have, in a way, a table from Evisa because we're all part of the Evisa structure with our president. So we are being honored and valued and is the value of our work. So I just want to thank everyone. Thank you. I like to also reinforce Mahalusi's words. Thank everyone for staying until now. And I'm very proud to be here with this team that we have and all the programs that we develop in a lot of areas, if anyone doesn't know, we have our accounts on social networks with the sanitary institution, all our secretaries, all the coordinations, food, health. We also have the nutrition unit and any ideas. Please follow us on social network, our projects, all our productions, everything that we do is on our social networks. Thank you so much for your attention. I would like to thank you for your attention. The information about capac all the trainings are available at our institute's webpage, also Instagram. We have uh, surveillance in course, vigilancia in curso. You can see all the list of all the uh, training courses, uh, the research lines, the lines of research not yet because they were launched in the September 30th, 30th, and we were impacted by the hacker attack because the panel was put together at CURB and CURB went offline because of the hacker attack because we have uh, information that CURB will go back into will back online next week. So maybe we'll be able to redo the panel 
and I hope that in two months you'll be able to to see online all the projects. We can see with Gabriel because we uh, we put together f a folder uh, that maybe you can put it on Instagram so that you can learn about the six projects in the safe in the area of food security and safe foods. Once again, I would like to. Just to conclude, I would like to thank you for the invitation on behalf of the State Secretariat of Rio de Janeiro and the person of Aline Borges, who represents the whole team. We are very honored to be here at the Global Forum. And uh, the Health Secretariat has its at, institutional at. But please, uh, but it was, uh, it was, uh, a pleasure to participate in this panel, but if you want to be, be in contact, get in contact with us, my personal LinkedIn is Katiana Telefra, and we would like to conclude this panel by thanking all of you for being here to this late hour in the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.